This is part two of the presentation. And as I have mentioned, we are talking about epilepsy mimickers in infancy and childhood. And as I have mentioned also that I'm going to present abnormal events that simulate epileptic disorders. But really they are not epileptic events or seizures. And this is, will save our children a lot of medications, unneeded medications, and sometimes harmful, because if we are going to treat these events, it is inappropriate and it may affect actually the neurodevelopment of our children. And as you know that the misdiagnosis of epilepsy in children with refractory seizures is as high as 39%. And this was mentioned by Oldal et al. in 2016. Also, the burden of anti-epileptic medications, whether the cost or the side effects, will be inappropriate to use in such disorders. The social and psychological implications of carrying such diagnosis is adding to the stigmata of the wrong diagnosis. Again, infants, neonates, and children are very prone to developing non-epileptic episodes because of the developing, the nature of the developing brain month by month. For example, the myelination milestones develops starting early in fetal period and continues as uh, like it starts 16 weeks intranatal and continues up to the age of two or three years. And if we are going to stratify or classify these disorders, we have four major groups. The first group is generalized paroxysms and drop attacks. The second one is jerks and abnormal postures. The third one is the oculomotor abnormalities. And the last one and fourth one is the sleep disorders. And as you see, each group is further stratified according to the age bracket of occurrence. There are some disorders occurring in neonates as apnea and the hyperacuplexia in this group, the first group, and in infants we have hyperacuplexia or hyperacuplexia is still occurring, reflex anoxic seizures, breath holding episodes, benign paroxysmal vertigo. And in children we have the compulsive valsalfa, alternating hemiplegia, familial hemiplegic migraine, syncope, psychogenic seizures, and cataplexy. The second group of the jerks and abnormal postures is represented in neonates by the jitterness, in infants by the Sandfer syndrome, paroxysmal dystonic choreoacetosis, benign myclonus of early infancy, benign paroxysmal torticollis, and other psychological disorders. In children, represented by tics and Tourette syndrome, paroxysmal dyskinesias, and episodic attacks. The, four, the third group is the oculomotor abnormalities, represented in neonates by the paroxysmal tonic upward gaze, in infants by oculomotor apraxia, spasmus newtons, opsoclonus, and in children by daydreaming. The fourth group, which is the sleep disorders represented in neonates by benign neonatal sleep myclonus and sleep transition disorders. In children and adolescents, we have either non-REM disorders or REM disorders. The non-REM as the night terrors and the REM sleep disorders as the uh, uh, narcolepsy and cataplexy others and other disorders. Now we we'll start by the first group, which is the generalized paroxysms and drop attacks. 
The first category is the syncopal attacks. Syncopal attacks, it is loss of consciousness due to transitory decline in cerebral blood flow. And there are four, there are three mechanisms behind the syncopal attacks. Either it is a neural, respiratory, or cardiac. The neural syncope, it occurs as The neural syncope, it occurs as reflex anoxic seizures, vasovagal attacks or orthostatic syncope. The reflex anoxic seizure, it is one of the two types of the breath holding spells in infants. You know that we have two types of breath holding spells, either the cyanotic spells or the pal pallid spells. This is the pallid spell, which is the reflex anoxic seizures. The reflex anoxic seizures occurs after minor pump to the head or a painful stimulus to the infant. When he starts crying, there will be reflex cardiac inhibition, diminishing the cerebral blood flow, and it eventually will lead to loss of consciousness and pallor. It typically occurs between the age of 18 months to, the seven, to 4 years, and if prolonged enough the, I mean the anoxia to the brain is prolonged enough, it will be followed by what we call a brainstem release phenomena, and it will be associated with tonic posturing of the body. The vasovagal syncope, the second type of the neural syncope, it is usually precipitated by fatigue, emotional stress, dehydration, pain, or vomiting. The prodroma is a blaring of vision, tinnitus, either one or more of these symptoms, dizziness, sweating, nausea, and dizziness. The event is, starts by gradual onset and ends by gradual offset. It will be uh, presented by loss of consciousness, usually for seconds. The last category is the orthostatic syncope, which is related to the posture of the uh, infant or the child, when you suddenly change your posture from sitting to standing, there will be pooling of the blood to the peripheries and it eventually leads to loss of consciousness for seconds and the onset also and the offset are gradual. The patient might or the infant might have some prodrome, the same as the vasovagal syncope as a blurring of vision, tinnitus, dizziness, or sweating. The respiratory mediated syncope, which is a classic press holding spells, the cyanotic spells, it is precipitated by any upset or anger or frustration to the infant. When he starts crying, he will have a prolonged expiratory apnea, followed by loss of consciousness, usually four seconds, with plush discoloration of the face and lips, and if prolonged enough, the brain anoxia will lead to a brain stem release phenomena and it will be associated with tonic posturing of the body. And this part of tonic posturing is the precipitating factor for a misdiagnosis of epilepsy. When we, some physicians see this tonic posturing and even the parents, they will think that the patient have a seizure. And when it will describe or she will describe this event to the physician, he will might start prescribing seizure medication because of this motor event or tonic posturing. The last group is a cardiac syncope, which occurs during sleep or exercise due to a cardiac problem or arrhythmia, and it have a prodrome usually of a dyspnea or chest pain. Its onset is abrupt and, onset, and it ends also abruptly. It, uh, the loss of consciousness will be for seconds and there might be a, a pale uh, pal uh, pallor uh, uh, to the face or lips. Now the second uh, group or the second category is the apnea. Apnea could occur in neonates and mimic a seizure disorder. But before discussing apnea, we have to differentiate between a periodic breathing and apnea. 
the periodic breathing which occurs in uh, neonates uh, due to immaturity of the respiratory center, it manifests by a regular respiratory pattern with intermittent pauses of 3 to 6 seconds, often followed by 10 to 15 seconds of hyperapnea. Characteristically, the poses are not associated with significant alterations in vital signs or skin color. If the neonate is on pulse oximeter, you look at the pulse oximeter during this event, you will find no changes in uh, the uh, heart rate and clinically there is no change in skin color. And this is important to differentiate the periodic breathing from the apnea. The neonatal apnea it is cessation of breathing for 15 seconds or longer, usually associated with a 20% reduction in heart rate. Longer episodes of apnea are associated with a 40% or greater reduction in heart rate. The frequency of these apneic spells correlates with the brainstem myelination. And even at 40 weeks of conceptional age, the premature newborns continue to have a higher incidence of apnea then do full-term newborns. Now, important differentiating factor between the apnea and the seizure is that the prolonged apnea without bradycardia and especially with tachycardia is a seizure until proved otherwise. And the apneic spells are almost never a seizure manifestation unless they are associated with a tonic deviation of the eyes, tonic stiffening of the body, or characteristic limb movements. So the golden rule now is apnea with a tachycardia is a seizure until proved otherwise. Apnea with bradycardia is not a seizure until proved otherwise. Now we'll see this demonstration of a 15 years old child that have abnormal motor events and these motor events were diagnosed as a seizure disorder. This young adult was having epilepsy sometime in the past like three to four years before the onset of this event. And this was treated appropriately with a seizure medication and eventually they have a seizure remission for two years. After that period, this uh, adolescent starts to have again a motor events in the form of what was diagnosed as a seizure disorder. I have no control, actually I want to uh, get to the event. I'll pause. See the background of the EEG apart from the muscle artifacts. Uh, it is not epileptogenic. There is no abnormal focal or paroxysmal discharge in the EEG. These are muscle artifacts. Uh, now she starts these abnormal clonic events involving the 
left upper arm and right lower leg and then now the right upper limb it is rocking movement actually it's not the typical clonic movements of epilepsy now the head is moving hyper extension of the neck as you see now rocking again of the head and shivering of the lower limb and the EEG showing the muscle artifacts again this is not spikes now it is dystonic posturing of the left upper limb now rocking and yes and shivering of the right upper limb as you see now the bed is going to have it's rocking movement, you see. The EEG is full of artifacts and muscle artifacts, but no epileptogenic event. This is typical psychogenic seizure. There is bizarre movements, different types of movement. Sometimes shivering, rocking, banging, dystonic movements of the arms, uh, sometimes rushing. Now, strength starting to bend. Now spice-killing movement of the lower limbs. Again, the EEG showed these abnormal muscle artifacts. Now it starts to have some slowing in the background due to the hyperventilation she is doing. This is electrode artifact. Alarming. It gives a pulse ox rating, but not really. Tiffany, can you hear me? Okay. This is psychogenic, psychogenic seizures, characteristic, characterized by the presence of a model. The model here is the patient himself or herself because she had epilepsy two or three years ago and she knows well what epileptic disorders looks like. Again, she might see in an epileptic clinic or, in, uh, or at a hospital another patient having these seizures and she can simulate the seizure herself. Again, she might saw the videos of her seizures by her parents. So the model is present. There is psychological stress, yes, there is a frustration. Usually those children have a great support from their parents for a long time. And after being treated and seizure-free, this might reflect some frustration due to withdrawal of the great support of their parents. The age of uh, onset usually occurs in adolescence, as you saw there is no prodrome. Uh, occurs in epileptics, uh, the onset is gradual. What's important? The, the movements. The movements are bizarre limb movements, all types of movements. Uh, rocking, uh, shivering, uh, shaking, uh, rubbing, uh, any, anything. And it is asynchronous, sometimes involving uh, left and right, left upper limb, right lower limb at the same time. There is a complete asynchrony. Uh, the patient does not injure himself, there is no post-ectal depression, and there is no fecal or urinary incontinence. This is a psychogenic seizures. Now, this unit having some myclonic events stimulated by uh, rocking and striking the incubator box. Every time we rock the incubator or strike the incubator, it has this myclonic event. 
as you see it involves upper limbs and both upper limbs and both lower limbs you see it is non habituating and this is important now when we strike the nose it has a plinks and now it increases the jerking of the upper limb what is characteristic here this event is non habituating i mean every time we stimulate the baby it will have these abnormal jerks because it differentiates this disorder from other disorders that is habituating when we do the stimulation for two or three or four times it will stop it will not continue to elicit the event that's what i mean but here whatever the number of stimulatory effect it will have again and again this type of abnormal movement you see it is not happy to wait anymore. what we call this is hyperechoplexia hyperechoplexia is sporadic or dominantly inherited life threatening event with in neonatal onset the defect usually in the alpha or beta subunits of the glycine receptor at uh, locus 32 long arm of chromosome 5 a triad of generalized characterized by triad of generalized stiffness nocturnal myoclonus and a pathological starter reflex tapping the nose produces a starter reflex with closure of the eyes and an extension of the extremities rigid rigidity diminishes but does not disappear during sleep tendon reflexes are brisk and the response spreads to other muscles swallowing is poor in older children there might be generalized stiffness similar to paralysis and possibly resulting in uncontrolled fall. Pathing, awakening, or auditory and tactile stimuli might induce an attack. This is uh, hyperechoplexia, and it is a non-habituating stimulatory myoclonic jerks. The best treatment is by clonazepam, valproate, or levetiracetam. Migraine and related disorder, another group of abnormal. Uh, events or or paroxysmal events we'll discuss familial hemiplegic migraine that begins as early as 5 to 7 years of age it always manifests with at least two types of aura visual sensory motor or aphasic it may be precipitated by trivial head trauma exertion or emotional stress hemiplegia at last headache by 2 to 3 days interactor cerebellar deficits as nystagmus or ataxia might occur it is autosomal dominant two genes have been implicated in the familial types the other disorder is benign paroxysmal vertigo it consists of episodes of brief imbalance during which the child appears frightened there might be nystagmus diaphoresis nausea and vomiting Episodes remit by age five years, attacks resolve with sleep, and there might be family history of migraine. Alternating hemiplegia of childhood during the first 18 months of life, attacks of hemiplegia on one or both sides lasting hours or days. Dystonic and tonic episodes often occur in younger infants. is sleep often abhors the attacks and this is important differentiating factor between it and epilepsy most the children develop ataxia developmental delay and persistent chorioacidosis the pathogenesis might be a chenilopathy or a mitochondrial cytopathy the best treatment with calcium channel procalflunarizine el hawa spilium Cyclic vomiting syndrome, another disorder that mimics epilepsy. It occurs at the age of 5 to 8 years. It is characterized by recurrent episodes of intense nausea and vomiting up to 4 times per hour. Attacks may last 24 to 72 hours. 
The attacks are characterized by being stereotyped in timing, duration, and symptomatology. There is usually a positive family history of migraine. Now, the second group of abnormal events that mimic epilepsy are jerks and abnormal postures. We will see this infant that have arching of the back in a visotonic posturing and he is still awake and aware, he is crying consolably with the stonic posturing of the lower limbs with some sort of severe spasticity and fisting of the upper limb. You see this child having abnormal facial twitches, closure and opening of the eyes, rubbing of his clothes, his tongue is moving in bizarre like movement, still twitching and closing, closure and opening of the eyes, facial twitches, blinking. So, this is a bizarre type of movements of the face. We call this is type of tardif dyskinesia. And tardif dyskinesia of the face usually follows the use of psychotropic medications. The examples of the jerks and abnormal postures in children are four major disorders, the benign paroxysmal torticollis of infancy, paroxysmal dystonic chorioacetosis, paroxysmal kinesigenic chorioacetosis, and paroxysmal dystonia induced by exercise. Each differs or characterized by a prodrome, precipitators, and attack duration and frequency. The benign paroxysmal torticollis of infancy has a prodrome of pallor, irritability, vomiting, and ataxia, it begins as early as three months of age and spontaneously remits before the age of five or five years. It lasts for a few minutes up to days or rarely it lasts for weeks. It is precipitated by sudden change in posture of the infant. The paroxysmal dystonic chorioacetosis, it is autosomal, autosomal dominant disorder with a locus uh, at the long arm of chromosome 2. Uh, it is precipitated by excessive administration of tea, coffee, chocolate, sometimes fatigability, hunger, stress. It may start at birth in the neonatal period, but usually occurs in infants, consists of choreic, dystonic, ballistic, or mixed movements in the face and extremities. The duration is from 5 minutes to 6 hours. The frequency is from 4 times daily up to uh, 1 attack per month. The paroxysmal kinesigenic choreoacetosis, the same prodrome as the dystonic choreoacetosis, but the precipitating factor here is a startle or abrupt movements. The age group is older than the dystonic type, occurring at 6 to 15 years. The lower limbs or upper limbs are involved. The duration is less than one minute. The frequency is 100 times per day, up to once per month. The last category is the paroxysmal dystonic induced exercise. It is characterized by by uh, uh, the same uh, event, which is dystonia, but the precipitating factor is prolonged exercise. The age of onset is very wide, from 2 years up to 30 years. The duration is from 5 to 30 minutes, and the frequency the same is from once daily to 2 per month. These disorders 
described before are a rare one, but we have to know these types of. Now, another example of abnormal jerks in children. You see this child while watching the TV has this nodding of the head and now he's sitting playing, he's completely awake and aware and alert. Again, he has these abnormal jerks. Sometimes in the face, sometimes in the shoulders. But to be alert, there is no diminishing or decreased level of consciousness. Again, in the head. This, what we saw, were a complex motor tics because it involved more than one simple motor event. We'll see this infant, we'll see the eyes, the, the previous child was normal child, but this one has a septo-optic dysplasia and now he, she's having twitches in the face, in one eye, again, you see the twitches, it is abnormal movement, you might have a consultation at hospital because of this abnormal movement, and young physicians or recent physicians may uh, refer this patient as being as epilepsy. But you see, these jerks, the patient level of consciousness is not changed. This is a normal child. Again, he has some of these uh, movements uh, in the face while eating. You see the angle of the mouse? It is. Oh my gosh. The left angle of the mouse. Now we'll discuss this Tourette and uh, Tics and Tourette syndrome. Tics are sudden, brief, verboseless, stereotyped movements of or utterances. Utterances means it's vocal sounds. Onset any time from the age of 1 to 15 years. Characterized by being suppressible with some discomfort. Reproducible. It, the patient and the child can reproduce and uh, do it by his uh, by him